Hello again. So the next phase of our um, presentation is going to go through the departments in the school. Each chair is going to get up and tell you a little bit about what's going on in their department because um, it might be the case that from your experience in high school, you really didn't get a good view of all the choices that engineers have. Uh, lots of schools have a robotics club, but not as many schools have a material science club or a bioengineering club, just because it's too expensive to do those kinds of things. Um, in fact, one of the things we realized this year is that it might, not, it might be the case that someone knows they want to be an engineer and doesn't know exactly what department they want to be in. So for the first time this year, we introduced the option of applying to the School of Engineering as an undeclared student. How many people, raise your hands, how many students here today went for that and applied undeclared? Yeah, I, I see several. So that's actually nothing, that's a great choice. So, so one of the things you need to learn as an engineer is when to say, I don't know yet because I don't have enough data. And we'll talk more about how to collect more data. Uh, you can, later on today, there's going to be an undeclared session. We'll talk about how you can figure out from among these departments what's going to be the best fit for you. But right now I want to move on through the chairs of the departments. Um, that we're going to start with the bioengineering department and Professor Ben Wu is going to talk about the bioengineering department. I just want to say one thing about the bioengineering department and their focus on undergraduates. We started a new program in undergraduate advising this spring quarter where it, it has long been the case that every undergraduate is assigned a faculty advisor within the School of Engineering, but we wanted to make sure that, that the undergraduates were really taking advantage of their faculty advisor to get some, you know, to take advantage of the opportunities for mentorship and guidance that you could have by having that one-on-one -on -one relationship with a professor. So we ask all the professors to sign up for three hours during the second week of the quarter, you know, just publicly post them when they were going to meet with their uh, undergraduate advisees, and the undergraduate advisees see it on their own personal website. This is your advisor, this is when they can see you, and if, they're, if you, you're not available then you can go see somebody else. Anyway, the bioengineering department, their faculty were the first to completely sign up for these time slots to make sure that they were available. And that, that's not a coincidence, you know, in my uh, time as associate dean working with the bioengineering department, I really see that focus, they're, they're, they pay attention to their undergraduates. So with that in mind, here's Professor Ben Wu. Thank you, Dean Wessel. That was a great introduction. Uh, I'd like to extend my congratulations to the parents. As a parent myself, I have young children, and I hope that in a few years I will be sitting in your seats looking up here, although I, I understand that the application process is getting harder and harder. So uh, I think we have three to four minutes per department to tell you what it is that we do. And I think that that's pretty difficult, so let me get started. Uh, I think that by the end of the next half hour, you will see that engineers, besides master builders, we are great problem solvers. So bioengineering students, bioengineers solve medical problems. We work with doctors to solve medical problems. We work with biologists to come up with new quantitative tools to better study and analyze biology. And by better understanding biology, we'll be in a better position in the future to build better tools to help people. You know, in the 1950s, Congress established NIH, the National Institutes of Health, to focus national dollars to improve health care. In the 50s, we saw the establishment of many new technologies that didn't exist before, for example, um, just simple things like pacemakers. How many people know someone who has a pacemaker? 1950s. Okay, we're still building them. They're much better than ever before. Now they can have rechargeable batteries and, and new programming. But, you know, th those are old technologies that our medical engineers developed in the 50s. Um, heart lung machines to help people during heart transplants. These are expensive equipment that NIH funded to establish so that doctors can do their procedures better. In the 1960s, the establishment of the Medicare Medicaid program further fueled companies to make more technologies to help doctors do better job. So, you know, we have the establishment of ultrasound. How many people have seen pictures from ultrasound? I think you, you guys have all seen those, right? 1960s. 
hearing aids were established in the 1960s. You know, a decade later, implantable hearing aids were, were created. Nowadays, you know, I'm working with companies that are making hearing aids that you can wear in your mouth wirelessly, that you can hear without anybody seeing this hearing aid. So the you know, technology is just flying right in front of our eyes. In the 1970s, we saw the establishments of HMOs, insurance companies try to cut costs and reduce um, financial burden. And so we saw the establishment of many imaging technologies to you know, prevent diseases from happening or diagnose small lesions before they become very big. And what we saw was the establishment of CT scans. How many people have seen CT scans or had CT scans? PET scan, positive emission tomography were created at UCLA actually. Um, so there were a lot of imaging technologies that were created. The first hip implant, total hip implant, the modern style hip implants were created in the 1970s you know, with the help of biomedical engineers. So there are a lot of technologies that biomedical engineers work on that impact society in every way possible. In the 1980s, you know, the FDA really figured out how to improve, how to approve uh, devices. And so we saw the establishment of many minimally invasive devices. Lasers were commonplace angioplasty, many types of um, small procedures become commonplace, endoscopy. These are things that we do as biomedical engineers. In the 1970s, the Human Genome Project basically took center stage, and for the next two decades, stem cell therapy, regenerative medicine, the first tissue engineer skin was created by biomedical engineers. And so these are some of the things that we do. Looking into the future, I think the students will be working at how to manipulate small molecules, they will manipulate cells, they will manipulate tissues, they will manipulate organisms, all in a ways to help improve healthcare. Um, as a practicing clinician myself, I could see how technology transformed the way I diagnose and how I treat patients. And as a clinician, I can only help one patient at a time. As engineers, you all can help many patients at one time. So, I look forward to seeing you guys in the special session for bioengineering. So that's, uh, you know, that's something that's true about all of the engineering majors, this fact that we have an uncontrolled acceleration of technology. Now, that's not the technology of uncontrolled acceleration. I think that's what Toyota does. But, <laughs> um, but as you work with your... Uh, as you learn engineering, this fact makes it very exciting, but at the same time, very difficult, because you've got a lot to learn just to catch up with this train that's not only going at 70 miles an hour, but accelerating. And your job, what you're trying to do with, with this undergraduate education, you're trying to run and catch up and get on that train, and then eventually be an engineer, drive the train. Um, as it moves forward, as it accelerates further, um, and it's just such an exciting thing to do. So I, that's why I think it's such a great choice to choose to be an engineer. Um, but I'm talking too much. So, and, and also I want to remind the chairs that we do have a, you know, it's like three to four minutes we're looking for. So um, I wanted to say um, our next speaker is Professor Mambuquet from the Chemical and Biomolecular Engineering um, group and even though so that's chemical but chemical and biomolecular bio has a lot to do with a lot of the departments for example his research um, helps to address issues of addiction and Parkinson's disease it's really exciting work so um, Hal come on up well good morning and uh, welcome and congratulations um, I'm especially anxious to talk to our uh, future chemical and biomolecular engineers. I, I think there's just never been a better time to be a chemical and biomolecular engineer. And uh, as the future chemical and biomolecular engineers know, uh, chemicals, after all, are good, right? Virtually every tangible product out there is composed of chemicals. We are composed of chemicals and chemical engineers play a role in, uh, in producing them. If it weren't for chemical engineers, we couldn't get in our car and drive it to work or to school in the morning. We couldn't uh, toast our toast. Uh, we wouldn't have uh, penicillin when we get sick. And uh, mom and dad, I know it's been a while, but it was actually a chemical engineer who invented those disposable diapers. 
as well as Pringles. Uh, and there are chemical engineers that are employed over the hill at uh, Anheuser-Busch making our beer. Um, so chemical engineers, for chemical engineers, the opportunities really are incredibly broad. Yet the challenges are huge too, right? How are we going to provide energy, potable water, uh, access to information, shelter, and so on for a, for a uh, growing human population in an environmentally sustainable manner. And this is just, these are just huge problems, right? And these are the problems that we're facing now and we're going to face in the future. And chemical and biomolecular engineers have a key role to play here. Of course, chemical and biomolecular engineers aren't doing this alone. Uh, things are becoming increasingly collaborative, and that is with other engineers and with other scientists. And this makes things even more exciting, more fun. And it makes education at a place like the UCLA School of Engineering and Applied Science even more important, where all the engineering departments are very strong. So you get to work with engineers of a variety of disciplines and, and to look at uh, these challenging problems for the future. So I look forward to uh, discussing in more depth our, uh, our terrific programs in chemical and biomolecular engineering. And I really hope you uh, have a, a fun and enjoyable day today. Thank you. OK, next up is civil and environmental engineering. And we're going to hear from Professor J.S. Chen who was uh, just a, a couple of years ago named a chancellor's professor. He's a true scholar and a gentleman. J.S., come on. Good morning. Uh, welcome and congratulations. Uh, I'm very excited to be here to talk to you a little bit about uh, how our faculty and students interact beyond the classroom meetings. I believe you still remember Katrina the recent earthquakes is just one after the other. Just in the past few weeks, our faculty are, and students are traveling in many different places. They just came back, actually, for example, last week from Chile. They are busy visiting uh, Indonesia and, and, and Mexico. Uh, and then in California, we deal with uh, wildfires. When the weather is too dry and the weather is too wet, then we get landslide. Uh, we need the clean water systems. We need uh, a sustainable uh, environmental systems. And all of all this, our students and faculty, that they work together uh, to work on all these very important and challenging problems through the funded projects, through, for example, the classroom projects. The students get to collect data and do some analysis on all these things. Uh, students get to experience the practical side of the knowledge that they learn from the class, uh, for example, through the independent study, working directly with our faculty and, and graduate students. Uh, they also have a lot of site visits. Uh, they work in our, our faculty's uh, research group that we encourage them to do that. So they get together and work on all these problems that are very closely related to the safety and the quality of our daily life. Uh, we have 16 faculty with uh, four major fields that you can see from the slides. Uh, the environmental engineering, the structural engineering, the mechanics, the geotechnical engineering, the hydrology, and water resources. We have 16 faculty. So this is really a mid, medium-sized department. But that creates the environment for faculty and students to work very closely together. We also have a very strong student uh, association and some student chapters. Uh, our faculty work very closely with them. And uh, so for example, they arrange seminar in addition to the departmental seminars. Uh, they, they invite uh, speakers, not only from our own department, the faculty and graduate students, but also from uh, pra uh, practitioners from outside. Uh, they arrange side visits. They even arrange job fairs. Uh, twice a year. So for example, this year, more than 30 companies, they come here and interview with our students. So our students are all very well placed. Um, our faculty uh, are really the leaders in their 
field of expertise. Uh, this, you know, the quality of our education and, and, and research programs is reflected in our continuous increase of research expenditures over the past 10 years. Last year, for example, we had a 33% increase of our research expenditure compared to the year ago. And this year, for example, a group of our faculty received a $4.5 million NSF National Science Foundation grant uh, as an extension of a center for uh, earthquake uh, engineering simulation earthquake, uh, network. We are one of the 14 sites in the US. And uh, another example is uh, uh, that we received a $3.5 million grant from the National Science Foundation uh, for the professional development of, of uh, science and technology in engineering and mathematics that benefits all our undergraduate and graduate students. Uh, so uh, I think uh, it is very exciting uh, in our department with all the activities. And I would also like to point out that last year, there's a document released by the American Society for Civil Engineers. It's called a report card. Uh, they evaluate the nation's infrastructure. They release a report card once every five years. And the last year's report card indicated that uh, there's a need of $2.2 trillion over the next five years to bring the nation's infrastructure in good condition. And uh, in fact, uh, President Obama's team already initiated this effort. And so I think uh, our students and our faculty as a whole are in a very good position to participate and contribute to this very important task for the nation. Uh, I hope that uh, I'll be able to provide you and our faculty and students will be able to provide you more inf useful information in la later breakout sessions. And uh, we look forward to, to talk to you, and we are here to help you. Thank you very much. So, so JS, what grade did the infrastructure get on the new report card? I think it's, uh, it, there are different items, but it's in between C's and D's. OK. So that's, thank you. So that's an improvement from the last time I looked at the report card that was mostly D's. But, the, the, that national infrastructure report card. But the thing that you have to realize is that those C's and D's mean that your A's and B's will lead to a job. There is a lot of work that needs to be done <laughs> or, uh, with the nation's infrastructure, and the, it's the civil engineers that are going to do it. And if you think about the importance of civil engineering, I mean, think about this. Think about the difference between what happened in Haiti and what happened in Chile. Haiti, not so much civil engineering. Chile, serious engineering for earthquakes. It's a matter of life and death. And you, do not, you don't have to leave the state to find a place that needs that. So a lot of...